On. Hi, hola madres and padres. My name's Nicola, and thank you, Monica, and thank you very much, Alex, for having inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the dream. This is what it's all about. This is not moving for some reason. It seems to be static. For some, if there's any way you could move it, can you turn it on? Thank you. This is the process of fermentation. It is a slow process, but probably not quite this slow. Um, you probably all know it being in the drinks industry. I'm sure you know about fermentation. This, these little things at the bottom, ah, oh, thank you, are, are like crystals, they're little jelly crystals. And they originally grew on the prickly pear cactus in Mexico, where they're known as tibicos. Um, I started off three years ago with a small handful, and I feed them with water and sugar and organic fruits to make a water kefir. You might have heard of the yogurty milk one, Kefir, this is the water one. The culture is known as the SCOBY. You probably have heard about SCOBYs with kombucha. And the symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeasts, which re react with the sugars to produce carbon dioxide. So it's, the drink you're drinking is naturally fizzy. This is a mother culture. This is me. But it feels, mostly it feels more like a hungry, screaming child demanding to be fed. I feel my role as a mother is interchangeable with it. We have a mutually dependent relationship. I look after it and it looks after me. It's full of probiotic goodness as part of the fermentation. And it means, on the whole, my gut has been, never been in better shape. I fell sideways into the, into the world of business from the film industry after a friend became ill and I was researching superfoods and water kefir fits the bill. The culture is alive and needs care and nurturing. We have to embrace variation and volatility. No batch is the same. Each has its own character and temperament. And there's a story behind each batch and every bottle. Of course, this resistance to uniformity brings challenges in an industry demanding ambience. It's a blessing and a curse that Agua de Madre is live in bottle, keeps fermenting and refuses to sit quietly in a warehouse shelf gathering dust for a year or more. It needs to be kept cold, but it was never going to be simple with such amazing health-giving properties. It has 25 million good healthy bacteria per 100 mil and a very naturally low alcohol, 1.2%. There's a growing body of research that shows how gut microflora is crucial to our health and immune systems. If you want an entertaining you know, read, I'm sure some of you have probably read Julia Ender's book, Gut. Um, but all of that points to something in a way even more important than us alone, how we're connected through our gut with the wider environment. Just one example here is the bacterium M. vacai, which is found both in our guts and in the soil. It's been linked with increased immune response and with raised serotonin, which is the brain chemical that regulates moods and wards off depression. Healthy gut flora, healthy soil, healthy minds and bodies. They're all linked. As a living thing, the Madre culture embodies that link with the larger ecosystem and helps keep it healthy. As an example of how that shapes our approach, we're in the early stages of discussing how to use the culture in a game-changing composting process designed to boost carbon capture in the soil. So our yeast and good life bacteria is not just a commercial concern. We understand madre culture is intimately connected to the health of the soil in which we grow our food, an awareness we hope our consumers will absorb with every sip. Of course it's a drink, we want people to enjoy it, have fun with it, um, you're, the, you're drinking the Al Alcacus Negro version, which is the licorice one, but the, also the ginger is the other, is the original flavour. And I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, 
the, our next talk is co-hosted with World Class, and um, it's a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Um, these days, sorry, um, there's a lot of focus on individuals. I'm just gonna wait it out. Sorry, um, uh, but. I think we sometimes forget the importance of teamwork, so our next speaker is here to talk about that topic. She recently crossed the Atlantic Ocean as a part of a four-person team, so she definitely knows what she's talking about. Please welcome Laura Troy. I'm in the middle of the Atlantic on an ocean rowing boat with three people I barely know. The boat isn't much bigger than a large family car. And when I look out, all I see for miles and miles and miles is just the ocean. The team and I have got one task, and that's to row 3,000 miles across the Atlantic from Spain all the way over to the Caribbean. And we've got one goal. And that's to be the winning female team in the race against 27 other boats. Every now and again, a huge swell of water scoops up my oars and sends the handle crashing into my shin, confirming the fact that I don't actually like rowing. <laughs> and then I sit there with that view and I think, how the bloody hell did I get here? Today I'm going to be talking to you about how I went from a shopaholic beauty salon owner to minimalist ocean rower. I'm also going to tell you about how my team and I battled the, the Atlantic, the vast Atlantic and all of the challenges in between. Having told you that I rode across the Atlantic, some of you may made the assumption that I may be an athlete, maybe I'm a rower. Perhaps I came from a background of being outdoors or my parents were sporty, but none of that was true. As a child, I was a dancer and I spent all of my spare time in the dance studio. I wasn't interested in anything else. I didn't know how to climb trees. I never went camping because my family just wasn't into stuff like that. And the most ocean experience I had was getting on board a ferry, age seven, to go to Denmark, to Legoland. <coughs> the first time I went camping, I was 29, and the only reason that I went was because I fancied the guy that invited me. And even then, I had a horrible time, but I didn't tell him that. As a young adult, I realized my dream of becoming a professional dancer just wasn't gonna happen because my family didn't have enough money to send me to dance school. So that's when I set my heart on one day having my own beauty salon. I could play with makeup and cosmetics all day long and I could get paid for it. So fast forward to age 24 and I have my own beauty salon and staff. We were really busy, super successful and I earned lots of money. But the problem was, is no one ever taught me what to do with that money. So I spent it. I spent it on gadgets and gizmos, the latest technology, furniture to fill my house, and designer clothes to fill my ever-bursting wardrobe. And then as I approached 30, I started to panic. I felt as though life was passing me by. And I stood in my house, looked at all my things, and I looked inside of me and realized that all these things weren't making me happy. What I really wanted to be doing was able to run through the countryside. I wanted to be able to run up and over mountains. I wanted to do marathons and all of the cool adventures that I'd seen on TV. So with that, I decided to swap my things for experiences. I began selling all of my belongings and I thought to myself, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm going to become a runner. So I went out as the last thing I bought as a shopaholic was a pair of uh, running trainers, a really expensive pair of running trainers because expensive things makes us good at stuff, right? I laced them up and I wanted to go running around the block and at the end of the road was a bridge. It was 0.7 miles away. By the time I got to the bridge I had to stop. My lungs were on fire and my legs were burning. 
had to turn around and I walked back home and I was crying because I was so frustrated. Like, how could I not even run one mile? Each day I ran to the bridge and I ran a little bit further home until one day I could run all the way to the bridge and all the way back without stopping. I was able to run 1.4 miles. I was becoming a runner. 1.4 miles turned into 5 kilometres. That turned into 10, 10 kilometres. And within a few years, I was able to run half marathons and marathons. Fast forward to when I'm age 32, and I'm sat in my kitchen scrolling through Facebook when an event pops up. It's the kind of event that I'd always wanted to do, but I just knew that I wouldn't be able to do it. It was a 24-hour endurance event. I showed my then boyfriend, and he said, yeah, you wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, I gave it, I, I didn't think anything of that comment. I gave the post a like. I wrote something like, this looks really cool, and thought nothing more of it. And then later on that day, I received a message from a friend who knew the event organizers. He had a spare ticket, and did I want it? I didn't know anyone that was going to the event, I didn't have any of the right equipment, and I definitely hadn't been doing the right training. But six weeks later, I stood at the start line with a team of people that I'd never met. 25 and a half hours later, I finished the event. But not only had we finished it, we'd won it. And that was a real pivotal point in my life where I thought, well, I didn't think I could do that, and I did it. What else can I do? Over the next few years, my life changed quite dramatically through a roller coaster of events. The 24 hour event led to a 48 hour event where I was on the move for 56 hours in total. I didn't get any sleep, and I vowed during that event never to do anything like it again. The sleep deprivation was agonizing. But curiosity got the better of me, and I saw an event to row 1,800 miles around the coast of Great Britain. And I wasn't a rower, I didn't know how to row, but I thought to myself, I once wasn't a runner, and I taught myself how to run. Maybe I can teach myself how to row. As a result of rowing around Great Britain, I was then invited to join three strong women to row across the Atlantic. Despite not knowing the team and only having a handful of training sessions, a few months later, we stepped off land and onto our boat and we wouldn't see land or any other humans for six weeks or more. What could possibly go wrong? I'd like to play a game with you guys. This was our boat. It's 8.6 metres long by one and a half metres wide, perhaps the same surface area as this stage. And I would like you to imagine living on that boat for six weeks with three of your best friends you're shaking your head. <laughs> it gets worse. Uh, now I'd like you to imagine living on this boat with perhaps three of your work colleagues, maybe even three people from this room. And now imagine getting on with three people that you don't know. And then there's a few of the people that you suspect that you're not going to get on with. People ask me if the challenge was hard. And of course it was. We rode in two hour shifts, two hours on and two hours off, all throughout the day and all throughout the night. In our off shift, we would need to take care of our bodies, our hydration, our food, the boat, and our navigation. And on average, we would sleep for about one hour and 20 minutes. We pooed in a bucket and watched our teammates do the same. We ate a diet of dehydrated food for six weeks. Our bums were chafed, our hands were blistered, and our joints were swollen. And one day we counted the amount of steps we took and it was just 25 in a day. And at this point, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. The differences of personality on board the boat was quite great and that meant that the team dynamics didn't work very well. Not only were we taking part in the biggest adventure of our life but now we had to deal with social issues on board this tiny boat. I'll let you a little bit further into that secret. I was one of the people on the boat that was involved in the social issues. My personality was very different to someone else on board. Neither was a bad personality, they were just different. 
And the way that I like to think about it was that one person was like Bailey's, chocolatey and smooth, and the other one was like champagne, fruity and effervescent. Both delicious and both great for different occasions, but put together, they curdle and they don't mix. So I'm guessing you're wondering how we coped with that. Well, on board the boat, we had two questions that we would always ask ourselves. And number one was, are we safe and are we well? The answer was mostly yes, but if anyone on the boat was ever feeling under the weather, sad, or depleted, we would ask them, what can we do to make you feel better? And we would take action with their answer. And then the second question was, why are we here? And we always had the same answer, no matter what. And that was to win the female race. And what this did, this simplified everything. This allowed us to put aside our differences and focus on uniting our common goal as a team. Excuse me for a second. Despite the differences, believe it or not, there wasn't much conflict or negativity on the boat because we realised by expelling time and energy on negative thoughts, feelings and emotions, we was using precious resources and we wasn't able to get the task done. Now, in everyday life, if I was to ever meet someone that I didn't get on with, I would just flee, I would just go. But I couldn't escape from this boat. I was hundreds, if not thousands of miles from land. And at one stage, the closest humans to us were up in space. There was nowhere to hide. No matter how hard it was, I felt grateful for that situation. Perhaps it was the same personality traits that we didn't get on that actually made my teammate excellent at her job. There was a certain task on the boat, and that was to change the autopilot every four hours throughout the whole challenge. The autopilot keeps you on course. And she did it every shift. She got up early and did that task, that vital task. And I got news from land support that some of the other teams weren't doing it because they didn't know how to. And so they just left the autopilot on and then it burnt out. And then that, it broke and it meant their speed decreased. But because of my teammate, despite our differences, she did it every shift and we was able to main full speed. I was laying in the cabin one day and I was thinking about our relationship or lack of relationship. And I started to feel upset that we weren't friends. And then I realized that I was focusing on the negative. So I shifted my thought process and I started thinking about everything that she brought to the boat and everything that was good. And everything that was good between us, for instance, changing the autopilot, and we would fill up each other's water bottles, she would put sun cream on my back. We would keep our cabin really tidy. And even though we didn't get on, we was helping each other and that was helping us achieve our goal. Not only did we have our personal battles, but we also battled Mother Nature. There was one day where we was rowing for nine days straight because we had a headwind and six miles of that was with our left oar only. We had news that morning that the wind was going to only last for four hours. And so we put three people rowing and one person on hand steering to gain more power. But after five hours, it was very clear that the wind was not going to stop. Each hour into our rowing session, one of us on board the boat was feeling tired. But it was only ever one person at a time. So we provided encouragement and we just kept on going. And after nine hours, the wind finally stopped. We was able to have a rest. We celebrated with a massive bag of peanut M&Ms. But in that time, I got news from land support that some of the other teams had actually decided to stop rowing. We'd been traveling at 0.5 miles an hour for that four hours. So we'd covered just over four miles in nine hours with everybody on deck. But most importantly, all the other people that had stopped rowing had drifted back. So we'd actually made up about 10 miles. Not everything on the boat went to plan. The weather was always changing, things would break, and each of us would have good and bad shifts. And we had a saying on the boat, very simple saying, 
it will pass. We always knew that any bad situation would pass. There was this one day, we were 39 days into the challenge, and my body and my mind, I'd had enough. I didn't want to do it anymore. And I came out on deck and I said to the girls, I'm going to put my headphones in, and translated that meant, don't talk to me. And normally that would only last maybe one or two shifts, but it lasted for three days. I didn't think that that feeling would ever go, and I kept saying to myself, it will pass, it will pass. Excuse me. And then finally, after three days, I stepped out, I felt good, and the earphones came out. I use this phrase in my everyday life. It really helps now. If I'm in a difficult situation or a little bit of a sticky situation, I always know no matter what, it will pass and things will change. We also had another saying on the boat, and that was, just get on with it. I'd be laying in my cabin and the waves were as tall as a house. They would be crashing over the boat and it was so noisy that we couldn't get to sleep despite being exhausted. 1.50 in the morning, and imagine what it feels like when your alarm goes off. 1.15, you have to get out and start rowing. It was pitch black outside and it was cold. I was tucked up, warm inside my sleeping bag and I just did not want to go rowing. But my teammate was out there and she'd been rowing for two hours and she was desperate for a rest. She was waiting for me to come out. So I'd lay there and I'd say out loud, just get on with it. And with that, I'd get up, get dressed and get out. And I use this saying in my everyday life all the time. For example, doing the housework. I mean, who seriously likes doing the housework? It's like, just get on with it. And that task that's at the top of our list of things to do for days and days, maybe even months, perhaps even years, just get on with it. And for me, a typical one was I was the one that never put the bins out. I was the person running down the street in my pajamas after the bin man with the bin, with the bin bags in my, with my, in my hand. But now, I just get on with it. Something really simple. After 43 days, two hours and 20 minutes, we crossed the finish line in Antigua. But we also achieved our goal and we were the winning female team in the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge 2018. I think back to all the challenging times on the boat, the fact that my teammate and I didn't see eye to eye, I thought about that dreaded alarm going off in the middle of the night and the weather that made it feel like we were rowing through concrete and then I realised those were the juicy bits. Those were the bits that I learned the most from. It helped give me an understanding of people and situations and it provided me with a way to increase my patience, my discipline and my gratitude. So I'm sitting on the boat and I think back to the pair of trainers, I think back to the bridge, and I think back to the boyfriend that told me I couldn't do it. And then I think of all the events that have unraveled over the past few years, and then I realise we can do anything that we put our mind to. Thank you. Oh, it definitely puts things into perspective. So next time we are cleaning the toilets at 2 p.m., we will just get on with it. <laughs> um, passion takes you a long way, but dedication takes you even further. So it's funny how our industry has changed so much. It's almost, I don't know what time it is, but let's say it's 2 a.m., uh, 2 p.m., and we haven't even had a drink. Woohoo! Um, and we are continuing, oh, alcohol, sorry, alcohol, we've had drinks. Um, so our next collaboration is none other than Paul uh, introducing a special version of Everleaf. Welcome. Hello Paul, thank you very much. Um, my name is Paul Matthew and I'm the founder of 
Everleaf non-alcoholic aperitif, which you have coming around in front of you. Um, I'll tell you a bit about that at the end, but by all means sniff and sip if you want to. So I'm going to tell you firstly about where I've come from and why I've wanted to develop Everleaf. Uh, secondly, a little bit about what Everleaf is and how that evolved to give you an understanding of where that's come from. Um, and then I'll tell you about what you've got in front of you here, which is a, a slightly pimped version of Everleaf with the theme of understanding. So I've been bartending for 25 years now, uh, but for 10 of that, bartending was my second life and my first career was conservation biology. So I had conservation projects around the world. Um, that's the bartender me, bar owner me. That's the conservation me back in the day. Um, I was looking at some magnolias in China, but I had conservation projects looking mainly at tropical forest biology around the world. Um, and that was really following in the footsteps of my father, who is there. Um, so my father, Brian, was a botanist his whole life. Um, and so I got an understanding of plants from him. But while he liked to look at plants as plants and learn all about the plants themselves, that's him uh, in the mountains of Iran in the 1960s looking for crocuses and irises, which will be part of my life growing up. I was more interested in the understanding about the interactions between people and plants um, and looking at how people and plants can benefit each other in a way that people can help plants survive and the rare species survive and those can help with sustainable de development. So that this kind of double, double whammy of conservation and sustainable development was really important to me and that's why I went to conservation as opposed to botany. So how does this all relate to Everleaf? Um, I've always wanted to combine those two worlds of, of plants and, and the environment with my career in drinks. Um, and about three years ago when I moved back to London, having been working overseas in, in China and Cambodia, um, where people drink for more for the occasion than necessarily the alcohol. When I left London, it was all about how much alcohol was in your cocktail. Um, when I got back, having seen a lot of people drinking for the occasion and the moment, uh, I realised that London's scene had changed as well. And for me, there was a definite swing towards people looking at low and no options and it being much more about the occasion, more foodies out there. So I wanted to try and create something that fitted that brief and that's something we could serve in our bars that I'd be as proud of as any of the other amazing alcoholic drinks we have behind the bar. For me, an important part of being a bartender is working on, obviously, flavour, colour, aroma, but also texture. I find that a really important part of any drink, whether that's the temperature of your martini or how your sour is shaken or something like that. So I wanted to add texture to Everleaf. Um, and I look back at something that I'd been involved with in my early conservation career, which was uh, the trade in orchid species. So orchid tubers are used to make a, a drink across the Middle East in Turkey called salep. Now, uh, salep, picture's been cut off a little bit, but that's um, a salep seller in Smithfield Market in the 1700s. So salep was widely consumed. Uh, people would carry the, the bags of orchid tubers with them, collect other herbs and flavours on, on the root, and, uh, and make this thick kind of broth um, that was, uh, was often drunk on the way back from the pub in the evening as a fortifying strengthener, or early in the morning as an alternative to breakfast, made from these ground-up orchid tubers. So I, I dug up some orchid tubers from Dad's garden, dehydrated them, ground those up, uh, played around with a bunch of recipes, and actually had a really good texture in, in Everleaf before it was called Everleaf. Um, but unfortunately, orchid tubers aren't sustainable, as I've known from conservation, and I tried a number of different routes to get them, um, but nothing was truly sustainable. Most was in some way coming from wild-sourced orchids. So I looked around alternatives, and what you've got just on the, the other side of the photo there is uh, the voodoo lily, um, Amorpha phallus konjac, and that's something that I knew from Asia that's used to make some speciality foods. It has a, a big starchy tuber, um, and you can extract something called glucomannan from that, which adds this, this weight and texture and mouthfeel to a drink. So that's what I've ended up using in Everleaf. And then on top of that, um, Two of the, the main botanicals for me are iris uh, and crocus, obviously from my relationship with my father and his botanical career. So crocus gives us saffron, so all the colour you've got there is from saffron, uh, and oris root gives that kind of slightly violety, earthy flavour in the middle that you also get in some gins. And then around that I use some of the traditional botanicals that were used 
to make salad. So orange flower water, orange blossom, um, it, would, it would be sweetened, it would often have cinnamon, um, in some cases vanilla, so it's got all of those botanicals in it. And then I imagine what other plants will be found on the journey from Middle East to London and included some of those and some others that were important to me. So at the, at the beginning, um, you've got vetiver, which gives a really earthy citrus aroma. Alex knows well. Um, and then you've got uh, things like fennel seed, um, and then you've got gentian and quassia amara, which is a really bitter bark to give it length on the finish. And to me, that was that bittersweet flavor profile I love as a bartender, combined with the kind of texture. So what is this particular version that you've got in front of you. So this unique one that I've put together for Boar Symposium is, uh, contains a lot more of the crocus, saffron. So whilst Dad had spent his whole life studying crocuses, he'd never actually been out to the saffron fields where they grow. Uh, he'd only seen it in the wild. So we went out on a sourcing trip last year um, and are currently getting this from a cooperative in Spain. Um, so in those hills around the wild boar, they come down and feed on the crocuses. The flowers are picked early in the morning so they don't have bees on them. Um, all these things. And in the same way, all the different botanicals I'm trying to source sustainably. So in my conservation background, I'm trying to get an understanding of where every ingredient that I'm using is coming from. The sugar that we use to sweeten it is fair trade organic cane sugar. And again, I'm tracing where that's coming from. About finding out where all of the different components are, going out and meeting the farmers. The other thing that's special about this particular Everleaf is that I've used some of those original orchid tubers that are ground up. So this is a kind of hybrid of the salad evolution of Everleaf that I started off making in the kitchen and the commercial product that's available now. So it's a little bit of understanding about where it's come from. And really, that's it about Everleaf. Um, so Everleaf, sustainably sourced, botanical thing, non-alcoholic alternative that has mouthfeel and texture. Uh, and you'll probably find from tasting this that it's quite an intense flavour. I've really ramped up that saffron on the orange flower water. It's designed to be mixed, so mixing in cocktails or with soda or tonic. So it is really intense as you've got it there. I really hope you like it. Um, I'm all about transparency and, and openness about the whole of my sourcing and manufacture. So if anybody wants to ask me anything about it afterwards, I'll be around. And I'm really happy to share all my understanding and share everything about Everly. Thank you very much. So we are soon going to break for lunch and all of you should have had um, received a lunch ticket. So after uh, these uh, next two um, speakers, we will, the lunch will be served in this area. Uh, so I'm just giving you a heads up. Um, it can be difficult to carve out a path for oneself uh, these days. And it's very easy to get caught up in everyone else's opinion, um, stories or thinking or even advice. Uh, our next speaker uh, is here to share her story and explain why she decided to take control over her own narrative. Please welcome to the stage, Brigitte Susu Perini. Do you have that friend, colleague, a neighbor, a friend, a cousin that's always saying, I will always be by your side? Well, my coach and my boss are always telling me this, but here I am on this stage all by myself and I'm nervous. I would love to share a little bit about my story with you today. I am Togolese Beninese by birth, Ghanaian by forced migration, and Italian American by adoption. I recently added the Italian because, well, as my adoptive father was born Italian American. 
A few years ago, I would not have been confident and accepting of who I am to have been able to share this with you. I started processing everything I've gone through the last few years. And a couple of years ago, I decided to be deliberate on how to process everything I have gone through so I can understand all the pieces and know where to place them in my story. I, begin, I, be, I really believe the beginning of understanding who you are start at the journey of discovery and acceptance. The journey, however, will not be easy. Trust me, I know. But to really understand yourself, you must go on this journey. The first image is sticky notes. And this was the first day of producing my personal story, my stolen childhood. And this is basically my life laid before you on the, on the slide. And the second image is me uh, being interviewed by my team. And this was actually the last day of producing the documentary. While I was preparing for this event, I came across a quote that I believe sums up my story, which says, narratives are reframed and redrawn to facilitate a deeper and more understanding of self and other. I had to go on a journey to really get the pieces of my experience so I can start rewriting my story. I would love to, for you to go on a journey with me right now so you can learn a little bit about me. When I was seven, I was taken from my family by my own uncle. My uncle told my parents that I'm going to live with him in Lome, the capital of Togo, to continue my education and to help his wife around the house. But what he in fact did was trafficked me into Ghana and placed me in a shrine to become a trokoshi. A trokoshi is a, pra a practice whereby a young child, a girl, is taken into a shrine to atone for a sin committed by a family member, basically as a, sac a sacrifice. And I was chosen to be that girl. My story was um, reported by Christiana Mampo of CNN, and it was viewed worldwide. My now adoptive father saw the documentary and decided to come to Ghana to adopt me. The next image is my, uh, a picture of me, clearly in a school uniform. I had been taken out of the shrine and put back into school. Now, naturally, I should be smiling in this picture, but why am I not smiling? The day this picture was taken, I was asked to smile, but I felt there was nothing in my life I, had, I need to smile about because I was still processing everything that, I, that, was, that happened and that's happening, and I still missed my family. So in 2016, I was contacted by a journalist whom I had um, built a relationship with throughout the years. And she told me that we're going to apply for a grant by Impact Africa to produce a documentary. I laughed and I said, I don't know anything about producing a documentary. She said, don't worry, I can assist you. Now, I was very nervous, even though I knew I wanted to share my story to inspire others to find their voices, I was still nervous as to how people were going to perceive my story. So the first image is a picture of me on a beach in, in Togo, on the way to uh, my village. We spent two weeks on a journey and we spoke to a few people along the way to, under, to get understanding of this practice called Chokoshi, the system, so then I can understand what happened to me when I was a child. It was a very long, tiring two weeks of my life. I came across things I didn't want to, I didn't want to know, I wanted to bury for the rest of my life. And then some information gave me peace. I found out that actually when I was a child, I was very creative. I used to even compose songs. But my experience has suppressed that child and I became very worried and fearful, doubtful. Anybody who said anything about caring for me, I doubted them because I felt if I accept their love, I'll get rejected again. Because leaving my family, I felt they didn't like me. 
So the next picture is a picture of me in London last year. We received an award for um, um, Association International Broadcasting for Best Human Interest Story. I didn't put this picture up to show you that I have arrived. I'm showing you this picture to show you that my goal was to, for me to share my story to inspire others. And being that and we were recognized. That means that, that my story has reached millions and some people have been impacted and has been inspired. So the seven-year-old migrant child that was trafficked into Ghana at the age of seven stands before you as an associate producer working for Refined Creative. I always felt that sharing our stories is a way for us to all learn from each other so then we can, we can all grow together and share the struggles and the successes that we've all gone through. I work with a team of producers documenting other people's stories. For me, it's not about the fact that I want to share my story. I want to also learn other people's stories so then I can get a better understanding of the world and other people around me. When I travel into villages and other communities and, and assist others in telling their stories, it's, it, I get a sense of healing from that. For me, it took a very long time to be standing in front of you right now and I didn't get here on my own. When we were producing my story, it was a team of three people. And when we were on the journey, I felt there is no way I can entrust my life into their hands. But when I wanted to share my story, I didn't know when and where and who to speak to about it. I just know that to share my story, I must work with someone who understands, who can um, see me as me, not just the story that I have and extract the story from me and broadcast it. I wanted to work with someone who is willing to collaborate with me because that means they understand me and who I am, understand my story, and I, that gives me the ability to also understand where they are coming from and their professional experience to be able to entrust my story into their hands. This has been a long journey. And I'm standing here, I'm very happy about this opportunity because the journey, you cannot go on it alone. You need to have other people around you. If someone um, if someone wants to make, perhaps assist you in your journey or in your field, it's okay to stand in your ground and, and know, know what you believe. So then you're not just being used. When I was approached, I felt these journalists are going to just get my story and um, produce it, not really care about me. So I had to take the time to really understand where they are coming from and to have that understanding. So the first image is me in Nigeria. We, last year we went to Nigeria to produce a story on um, women's participation in electoral process. And in, um, during this production, I learned so much from different people and how it's important for us to include everyone's voices in everything that we do. You'll be tempted to compare yourself to other people in your field, around your neighborhood, in your schools. But what you have to realize is you have something unique inside of you that you have to offer to the world to make this place a better place. And also to best collaborate with other people you must be um, willing to speak up and know that you have something to contribute to the conversation. I often um, shy away from talking up, speaking up because I spent over 20 years uh, in silence. 
because I wasn't sure how people will, um, how I will sound and how people will receive what I'm saying. I knew I was, I was smart and I had something to say, but I just didn't know how to say it. So I kept silent for a very long time. And so now, when I'm in a group of, uh, with people and I'm at the workplace, I try my best to voice my opinion because that is part of the growth process and the collaboration. When you speak up, you realize that with somebody else's information and put it together, it's the best way to work, it's the best way to live, and it's the best way to grow. This journey that I'm on, I'm still discovering myself and I'm still processing everything. And so I, I just want to say that I would love for all of you to come on this journey with me because we are not alone. We cannot live alone. In order for us to do well in this world, we must work together. So the next picture, I actually hate this picture. And that's why I put it up here. I put it up here to show you that I'm still going through that growth process. Naturally, I wouldn't want this picture because I look very tiny at the back, like behind me. My back looks really tiny. But I place it up there because this, this time here is not about me. It's not about what I like. It's about me sharing with you guys and for you guys to also share with me so then we can all learn together and grow together. Right now, I really like, I really like um, smiling as like part of my hobby because I felt, um, Growing up, I was very sad and very timid and fearful and also was made fun of about my teeth. I often smile with uh, my hands over my mouth, but I have grown to the point of accepting all of me, accepting my story, accepting the process and everything that I've gone through so then I can be a better person. When I understand myself, I can then open up myself to understand others, so then we can all learn and grow together. Thank you. Okay, so before we break for lunch, we have one last collaboration um, and now we are moving on to cider so we will please welcome star Cove cider to the stage test hey. <laughs> um, I'll try and keep it friendly brief obviously because you've got lunch next and it's uh, you know not early, early in the day. Um, so, my name is Felix Nash. Uh, I set up a company actually five years ago now uh, called the Fine Cider Company. Uh, we, uh, we work like a wine merchant, but entirely focus on cider and perry. Um, one of the wonderful makers I have uh, the privilege to supply the, the drinks of each season is Star of Crow Cider. Um, I'm going to show you a few little slides and hopefully keep it quite quick and then move on to a short little video that will um, show you a little bit more thoroughly what they do and where they do it. And I suppose the key question I kind of want to want to pose and that they are a really wonderful part of the answer to is what cider can actually be. Uh, because. Today it's become a hugely, hugely industrialized thing, uh, particularly in, in this country. Uh, in, in Britain, for example, to call something cider today, it only needs to be made with 35% apple juice. That juice doesn't have to come from cider apples, which are a bit like you know, the, the wonderful domain of, uh, of wine grapes. Um, it can even be from concentrate. So you can have something that's 35% water, caramels, colorings, all sorts. Um, but it hasn't always been the case by any means. Uh, in the past, uh, particularly in a time that's known as the heyday of cider and perry making in Britain, uh, it was given the title as the native wine of England. Uh, it would be drunk from cider flutes. Uh, there's 
some even in the Museum of London here, out in Herefordshire, there's a museum with an amazing collection of these things. Beautiful uh, crystal glass, diamond etched and engraved. And the pursuit of making it was one that you'd really liken to the making of wine, but we're talking 1600s, 1700s, through into the 1800s. There's amazing connections to the people making cider in this manner, which the, the best bottles could be 60, 70 times the cost of the common stuff. Uh, connections to things like the invention of Verne Glaze bottle glass and the dawn of many, many sparkling drinks. Uh, I won't go into champagne with a kind of West Country grudge. Um, but, uh, as I say, what is occurring, particularly in the last five years and even more under the radar across the last 10 and 15 by certain makers, is really rediscovering and making in a manner that's more akin to that past. Uh, it's really since the likes of the 60s and 70s side has become so industrialized and the standards have slipped so much in this country, uh, but also around the world. And it's amazing seeing this sort of change is, is global. Uh, the US is mad for it. Um, there's quite a few of you here, but in February I went out to a thing they do in America called CiderCon, because they have a convention for everything. Um, and that's 1,500 makers from all over the world getting together. I mean, I mean literally all over the world. Um, so I say, I'll show you a few little slides. I'm going to keep it fairly brief and focus very much now on, on Starvecrow. Uh, I could speak for hours about it, um, but here's the plug for that. My book comes out in October. So. <laughs> Lovely. So there's two wonderful makers of uh, Starvecrow. One of them is pictured up here on the left, Ben Woolgate. Some of you may know of his uh, wonderful natural wine uh, company down uh, where they are based near Ryde and in East Sussex. Uh, that's called Tillingham Wines. Uh, Steve, the other maker, uh, we actually have here tucked away somewhere in the darkness, so um, you'll see him on the video and then you can uh, ask him questions later. I so say one of the wonderful, wonderful things about this kind of new wave of cider makers is they, they don't have just one ideal or one version of what cider can be, and they really come at it in a different kind of uh, perspective. A lot, of, a lot of makers have come with influence from wine. Um, and Ben's no, uh, Ben's no different, and Steve's ethos is, is, is very fitting in terms of the way that Ben already makes wine. He loves to use quivery, the Georgian clay amphora, of course, been used for thousands upon thousands of years for, uh, for winemaking. Uh, they're working with what I would term as East Coast fruit or non-traditional cider apples, things like Bramley's, uh, John of Gold's, Braben's. And, um, you could liken them a little bit in the cider world, or the cider they make, to being like the white wine equivalent to the traditional cider apples. Traditional cider apples are heavy in tannins, you get some very rich, slightly higher alcohol, fuller bodied uh, ciders from them. These are lower in alcohol, the acid is the more predominant thing, there's barely any tannins there. Um, and Ben and Steve are wonderfully really kind of proving, as a lot of makers in the US are, what you can really do with these fruit, uh, what you can create. So bringing a wonderful natural uh, manner of making, uh, incredibly minimal in its intervention. Um, here we go. Uh, very much working with pressing the juice, allowing the wild yeast in the ambient environment uh, from the fruit to, to undergo the fermentation. So in one of the last slides, we had floor from one of the quivery. It's always very variable, it's very small batch, wonderfully varied. Um, and one important thing with cider, a lot of the best makers do like to work with wild yeasts. You're talking, on average, about half the alcohol of wine. So makers aren't chapitalizing, they're not getting up to those higher alcohols. And so to work with as great a complexity as possible, the, the broad spectrum that wild yeast can be, uh, can really yield some wonderfully fascinating complex results. You know, particularly if you're talking this kind of East Coast fruit that uh, does not have the level of sugars. You know, we're only talking sort of five to six percent, rather than uh, the more like six, seven, eight. Um, and so this is some of the activity from the top of the uh, quiver on the left, and also some wonderful old space side barrel stuff that they do on the right. Um, Here's a number of different bottles. Four on the right are different staff crow. We've got the blue is a bourbon barrel aged quivery up top. Wonderful pet mount on the top right. And then the one you are drinking is on the down on the bottom right, which had uh, a little bit of conditioning sugar added for the, the wonderful natural spark when it went in bottle. And then two other fascinating bottles on the left. The top one was cider done in quivery on some Pinot Noir skins. Bottom one was on apple pomace. So again, the experimentation and the crossover between cider and wine is getting quite interestingly, uh, interestingly explored. So I will leave that there and just pass it over to a video.
It's all right. I think we're going to do it again with a bit more volume. Is that there? Let's do it again. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> So I'll just tell you a little of what you're going to see. Some wonderful young filmmakers went down to make a little, little film visiting the guys. This should show you a little of the orchards. Um, they are pretty old trees, up to 70 years old. Um, a lot of them are relatively large, but they're designed because it's traditionally eating a dessert fruit for hand picking rather than machine. So they're, they're, they're kept at a relatively small scale. But yeah, if it's ready, I'll let it go. Yeah. The approach to the cider making was dictated by the fact that we didn't really have any equipment. And so the only thing I could think of that we could ferment in, that we could come by easily and cheaply, is we were starting on a shoestring, still on a shoestring. We used to get some old whiskey casks. So my family have farmed here for yeah, several generations, or probably fourth or fifth generation, actually. My friend had pushed me for years to make cider, and I always resisted. And Ben, when he offered to help, was yeah, an absolute wealth of knowledge and resource and really bringing the winemaking side to it. And the overarching philosophy to the, you know, the treat, how we treat the, the apple juice and how we ferment it, they're aligned very closely to what I'm doing with my winemaking. So it's all about letting the wild yeast on the apples and in the environment ferment the juice, not adding anything. We've got a range of different media for fermenting in. So we've got stainless steel, a Georgian quivery. So quiveries have been used for the last eight to 9,000 uh, years in Georgia. And we fermented apple juice in this last year and it was really successful. We just put the apple juice in the top um, and while fermentation takes place and uh, seven months later we took it out of the pot and it tasted delicious. Like all good producers, you're going to experiment, you're going to try different things. I was keen to do things, I think we were both keen to do things as differently as possible. Mm. Not to go against the grain as it were, but to certainly differentiate ourselves. So it was non-traditional non varieties made in a different methodology. So my name is Nomi Noe, I work in Lyles, it's uh, run uh, by Gems in the Kitchen. I'm from Brittany, so for me cider always been something from Brittany or Normandy. I never really thought about the fact that there were a terroir for that in England. For me, even if where I come from, cider can be something very commercial and very industrial. Starcroft, the fact that it's made from four different apples, this kind of cider is like a bit beyond, like it's sour, acidic, super vibrant. I'm Ben Walgate. And I'm Steve Reeve, and we co-founded Starve Grey Cider. So uh, before the lunch, uh, I just want to say something. There's a lot of different people who support Spur and who believe in the vision and what the, what the, what the, what the foundation stands for. Uh, and they get very little back from us. They, they give a lot. And I thought that I dropped a few names of the people who really contribute in massive chunks of money so all of us can have this amazing day together. Uh, and these are the world class, one of the most amazing, the biggest cocktail competitions out there. The Distill Ventures supporting young uh, drinks entrepreneurs, Nonino Grappa, we got William Grant and Sons, the guys at Monkey 47 in Black Forest, from the US Michtes Whiskey, from France Monin Syrups, Havana Club from Cuba, London Essence Company from London. Uh, the guys at the, at the, at the Libby, like th these people, they're making substantial donations 
without getting anything back because they believe in the importance of having days like this when we stop for one day, uh, chat, meet and contemplate on where it's all heading. So a uh, massive round of applause for them. For the lunch, uh, stick to your goodie bags because you have some uh, lovely presents from some of our other collaborators. Uh, from uh, Lauren Mott and her husband of Bitterslink, you all have some bitters which are all inspired by the theme of understanding and you find a bunch of other things, so grab them. Uh, for, and I have a big favor to ask, uh, in order to accommodate everyone, we spread out massively all around the stage. Uh, this area here, guys, if you could kindly move out to the reception space, we're gonna take the benches away, then everybody is gonna enjoy lunch and uh, we're gonna meet back here in an hour's time, which would be enough for everybody to get fed, grab water, a bit of a coffee, uh, and I'll see you in one hour. Thanks.